finish the transition. Oh, use that word. You right there. <laughs> you uh, but I mean, it's just a lesson learned, man. Never let your barber watch football and cut your hair at the same time, man. That is mm-hmm. um, that is detrimental. So tonight's topic, man. Thank you guys for being on. Um, you are the church. Is the mission? True Seekers Temple is the group, and we are sitting here, man. And oh man, the night's topic is one that we've been dancing around for a while. Even touched on it with reparations, but really just talking about the accumulation of uh, wealth, and especially when it comes to our people. Um, one thing my brother has been adamant about for several years, and one thing that a lot of brothers have been adamant about for several years is that there's more than enough wealth in our community to be able to get us out of poverty. So why are we still in poverty? Um, and it's a weird conversation because it's like, it's a business side of me that's just like, American business is like, hey, man, you have to go get it. You know what I'm saying? Nobody can give you wealth. Like wealth is something that you have to, you know, cultivate a mindset from, cultivate a skill set to. And you, the wealth is just the value that you're putting out into the world. That's why it can't be given to you. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then there is a handicap that you have when you're born without those tools, that knowledge. And to continuously see people suffering from that handicap when you know the actual way to get to the bag of gold, that's something we definitely want to discuss. So just there's, a, oh, there's, ahead, another, piece, there's another piece we need to discuss. That's that's the piece we're gonna talk <clears throat> about today, man. There's why? another piece. Why? And the other piece good oh, the, go other, the, the other piece is if if and it's e- it's easiest to explain this way. 1790, 17, year of our Lord, 17, 90, I think, 89, 90, 91, somewhere in there. The first Congress of these freed colonies was ratified. The first laws written into code protecting rights to property in these lands, written into code as part of those laws, no person who is not British descent and Christian has the right to appeal to a court of law against anyone who is of British descent and Christian. Think about that. Yeah. We did not have the right to testify in court if you were brown or native to this land, which means you do not have the protection of law over your property. Is this and those, laws, those laws have been codified and carried through all the way to today. Not hard to so tell. We, so you can, we can create wealth. And one of the things we always wonder is how is it that another group can come over here and get ahead of us? They don't have the foundational, they don't have the statutory boundaries that we do. They don't have it. The laws are not set up to prevent them. Check it out. The laws are not set up to prevent them from accumulating wealth. The laws are set up to prevent us from accumulating wealth. So maybe one of the first things we need to do is also hire some lawyers, Mm. (laughs) Mm. you know, who can help steer us around some of those pitfalls. So that's kind of the foundation for the night's conversation, man. And um, it's actually going to be really just three questions tonight. Very straightforward, very quick um, and relatively quick conversation tonight. Because one of the things that I think um, I will agree with, and again, it's it, when it comes to us, man, it's, it's a little bit more complex than people want to give credence to. Um, 
It was always one of my favorite sayings is that you poor people can't learn rich people's lessons because they require a rich person's mindset. And I've always agreed with that because a mind who thinks in terms of no limitations can absorb and utilize information in a way that a mind set by boundaries can't. And since we have been first conditioned to the boundaries of our existence and then information second, it is very difficult for us to take the same information that gets people rich and do it for ourselves. So like, I'll give you a perfect example. There are a lot of us in the community who would easily support brothers who are now coming up and doing their thing. And even since George Floyd, the cry for Black economic support amongst Black people has been through the roof. Um, and it, it's been great. But there is no continuum for it. And what I mean is, is that if T.I. gets another um, opportunity in a movie, what's the trickle down effect to your community? If, you know, Killer Mike starts a bank, incredible. Where are the vendor opportunities for people in your community? How do now we service the bank to keep the bank flowing, to keep it going? How does the bank now employ the talented amongst us who are suitable for those roles? And those are the things that end up being kind of the scratch my head moments because as I've been able to, you know, break a lot of the mental boundaries that I had growing up about what it is to be able to accumulate wealth and to grow. Um, I realized that, you know, even when you're seeking and getting information as a black person, you're expecting to be held back. You're expecting to run into a brick wall. You're expecting at some point to meet some type of resistance that ultimately leads to failure. And with that mindset, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you almost have to retrain your mindset about what it is to accumulate wealth and to get it. And and like you said, Siku, that comes with certain lessons. It comes with, you know, actually having discussions on trust law. It becomes sitting down with attorneys and saying, how do we now shield our assets under the same protections that our counterparts do? How do we now grow? Because that is always the, the limiting factor. You can start a business, you can get a business maybe to a certain size, but how do you now scale that to an Amazon size? How do you now scale that to a Microsoft size? And to think that our people don't have the ability to come up with concepts that are that great and able to scale at that level is a joke. So what's keeping us back? What's keeping us from putting our resources together and growing? And if that's an internal question, man, how would you answer that? Like, what is keeping our people back from being financially successful other than the boundaries that we already know exist? Oh, man. So going back to what you said, it's all about a mind state. And like, think about this. You, you can't even fathom that many steps ahead if you haven't even like you like our current situation is is there are there are some people that are in situations that can see like the cusp of what an amazon will be but so many of us are not in that position not in that situation that it's difficult for you to even like even think in that in in those sort of terms like a lot of people definition of what success is isn't the definition of success for a lot of people or for, for people that don't look like us. Like, also it's been passed down to us that like, man, like, like in, in, even in simpler terms, like a lot of people think like, oh man, success is you're gonna go, you're gonna get this degree, then you're gonna go and you're gonna get this other degree nowadays because it's like, man, you need multiple degrees in order for people to look at you. So everybody says school is a thing that verifies you, but school is also a racket. Not saying that school's not important because I'm actually in the process of studying for my GMAT now to go back to get my MBA, but like people just value different things and that puts you in a different like thought process because now you got student loans that that weighs on your credit, even though everybody has student loans. It's different when you don't have to worry about that sort of stuff or you can stay with your parents and quickly pay your student loans off instead of doing that. 
Like it's just a different reality for a lot of different people, which allows them to be able to see the world in a different light, Mm -hmm. which allows them to harness the things that like some people take for granted and utilize them in a way that like propels them forward. You're looking at different things that are like, oh man, you know, I could see myself owning that corner store. And they not even thinking about no corner store at a thought. They think about like, man, like I could see myself opening the next whatever, but nationwide instead of just in the community. Right, right, right. Now, that's a great answer, man. I actually agree with you wholeheartedly on that one, man. I, I view it a lot of the same way that you do. Sifu, your question, man, same thing, man. Other than the barriers that we already know are limiting factors for us in our economic you know, advancement, what are some of the other things that are keeping us from moving forward? I mean, especially when you know what the pitfall is. I look at it a little bit differently. Um, I look mm-hmm. at it more from, a, from more, more simply. Um, you both, you, you both know who was, who Zeus, the, the company Zeus, right? Right here in South mm-hmm. Carolina, you know, where, mm-hmm. you know where they started? No. Started in his garage. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, he and um, his brother, and I think a cousin, um, initially purchased their first um, um, medical t- actually it was it wasn't just medical tubing it was medical tubing and and wire sheathing um, they purchased their first materials and sort of construed them out of some dye lots in their garage and I look at that kind of like it's a humble start it's the quote unquote American story. Um, it's, it was a humble start. It's where they started, but, but they grew it piece by piece. And it was a matter of this is where we're going to start and get our first contract, meet that, meet the, meet the production demands for that, take that, grow it, increase production, next contract, grow that. Now we're looking for extruders. Now we're looking for, um, meltdown machines now we 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 bring in our first um big box i think it's an 851 machine that does the extruding for us now we're bringing in raw materials and mixing our own dyes and everything so the answer the, the question for me comes down to i think part of the problem is we we look at our limitations yes because we have to be aware of them but we start the beginning of the journey as if we're already there. We look at all these challenges that we know we're going to have to face and we start the journey already amped up like, okay, I got to be, be prepared for this. I got to be prepared for that. I know this is going to come. I know that's going to come. I know this man's going to come and tell me I can't do this. Okay, well, hold up, slow up, slow up. How about just get started? Just get started. Mm-hmm. You, if you're aware those challenges are going to come, then walk your walk, understanding that they're going to come. So when you do see them, you're not surprised. Mm-hmm. But you got to be in the game first, right? So let's so let's just get started. Um, so for me, it's whatever we decide. And then the other thing is, no one. I was I was on I was at electronic data service. I was on the floor in a cubicle farm with a headset on my head, taking customer service calls for IBM and EDS. When a fellow walked up to me with a little envelope saying, "Hey man, there's this idea. It's this new this this new company going around. New co- new company concept going around. They they're taking the library and they're putting it online." There was no online at the time. This was back in, in the early 90s. So there was no online. I mean, it was there, but it was like that crazy dee, da dee, you know what I mean? That tone that you got when you try to connect. Dial-up. So, right? <laughs> it was dial-up. So it wasn't online like you have online. And this dude was talking about getting library books and books for, and, and, and world encyclopedia and whatnot off of this company online. And all you had to do was, it was, it was, I think it was like, it was, it was, it was $500 to buy into it. That's all it was, it was $500 to buy into it. And 
you may not have 500 off, off top right now, but if you give me 150, we'll hold your slot and you just pay this off by this quarter and then that's your 500 to get in. Trust me, this is going to be the thing. And I'm like, man, nobody buying no books offline. You know the name of that company? Probably Amazon. Amazon. Mm -hmm. None of us could see Amazon for what Amazon became back then. I sincerely doubt the people who were pushing that stuff, pushing that initial package, could imagine what Amazon was going to be back then. Right. But the concept that we have of Amazon now is not what they had in their minds back then. That is 100% true. So, yeah, we'd like to be able to scale up to an Amazon size, but right now, let's just get out, let's get out the door. Find an idea, and like Nike said, just do it. Hmm. find an idea what's it gonna be the guy who founded nike why did he do it because he was running and the shoes he was wearing was breaking his feet mm -hmm. so he went to a shoe manufacturer and said hey i got some new ideas can you do this and they all told him no so he went found <laughs> found some college buddies of his that helped him put the first of the sneakers together and he ran on them. They worked. He patented it, went overseas and found somebody who would help him put the first string together. How big is Nike? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he saw Nike the size of what it is. And I sincerely doubt when he was talking to his buddies in college, he was thinking, we're going to get NBA players to really just, Michael Jordan's going to, there wasn't no Michael Jordan then. He was just thinking, damn, these shoes hurt my feet. I need some shoes that right. don't hurt. Right. Value creation. Yeah. That's it. You know, so like we were saying, you were saying at the beginning, Kyle, you were talking about um, um, possibility of, you know, homeless or shelters for um, shelters for veterans. This is the first generation in this country where we have survivors from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wars. We have survivors from seven wars alive today. And the VA does not, to my knowledge, does not have an on the ground outreach that actively looks to place these people in transient homes where they're, where they're successful at it. Too many of them end up on the street. Now there's a whole bunch of programs that are designed to okay, get veterans into homes. You hear that all the time, veterans into homes, veterans into homes. But how many, how many chain like organizations are there like a McDonald's or Burger King or or how many how many Motel 6 or, or Microtels do you know that are built specifically around the needs mm -hmm. of veterans? Mm -hmm. How many Airbnb quote you know just to use that as a name how many of those are specifically designed around the needs of veterans? Mm -hmm. None mm -hmm. that I know of. So that might be the th that might be the thing to do. True and correct. No, I, I, blessings to your perspective, Sifu, man. That's that's dope. Um, second move of the night, man. This is uh, one that you just got to be honest with. If you became wealthy right now, both of you, just hypothetically, is it really your responsibility to now give back to your community? What do you think, Dre? I can go first. Yeah. I I definitely think so. Okay. Um, Why? I mean, the community, although it's <clears throat> I mean, it probably didn't make me rich, it still made me who I am today. And like, like I said, like I, I, I say this all the time while we don't hear, I believe it's the responsibility of the generation that comes after I mean, that comes before generation to shorten the time it takes in order for the generation that comes after you to get to the place where you are now. Mm -hmm. So 
Like, yeah, I think it's our responsibility, especially in the situation, that the predicament that we see ourselves in. Like, yeah, like one person made it, but like, what are you doing to, to reach back? Like, is it really enough for you to make it? Like, are you so self-centered or so selfish that like, man, like I made it, so I'm good. So let me play the little devil's advocate there. Um, it's not not that I say agree or disagree. It's just devil's advocate. I typically, if I'm successful, I have to move away from my community. Um, my community would usually shuns me or treats me, ostracizes me for being different. Um, when I am successful, when I do become successful, now I can't even really return to that community because you know Nipsey Hussle, perfect example. Young Snoop, two, we, we could just go on and on and on about how many brothers who were actually doing something for the community were slain by the same members of that community. So when you're looking at the track record, I wish there was a way to quantify it. Like if we actually sat down and broke down the statistical return on investment for a brother helping his community, the, the argument would probably be, it's better to get the hell away from your community and never look back than come back. Man, don't put, don't say nothing about my man Marshawn, then, because I hope my man Marshawn keep doing it and, and don't nothing happen to him. Hope, you know, what I'm saying, hope Beast Mode stay forever in God's graces. You hey, know Mar Marshawn, peace to the brother, man. And, and again, they are brothers who are successful in, you know, even redeveloping their communities without really much angst. But the the need of that community usually goes beyond affordable housing and rec centers. It usually ends up having to be time, effort, motivation, healthcare. Like the needs are just so plenty. You know, usually you'll see a brother like let's take um, <clears throat> um, Warren Dunn, and um, you know he he went out there and said, you know what, houses of single mothers in Tampa. Here's my niche. Here's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. I give away I think 50 houses a year, something yeah. like. That. And they're for all for single mothers in Tampa. That's what I'm focused on. And you'll see brothers necessarily pick a, a specific niche about how they want to return into the community. And the community usually tears them down for that shit. Well, what about the brothers? Are you doing all this for the single mothers? Well, goddamn. And that's and that's my issue with the way that they do it. So in answer to your question, ahead, yeah, but 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 that's my that's my issue with the way that they do it. So in answer to your question, do we owe it back? Yeah, we do, right? But it's the way it's done. Mm. For a little while, I worked for the government against my will. Um, and while working for the government, um, I had a fellow who was working, working along with me. Some okay. the hunt type shit. Yeah, they got me trapped. Okay. Yeah, they caught me with these bricks <laughs> and they was like, yo, I got to... <laughs> okay. Um, so there was another fellow who was in there working with me. And he told me, he said, now he wasn't in there for the same um, work-related reasons I was in there. He was under some, some other work-related reasons. Um, White-collar stuff. Mm -hmm. and he told me, he said, he said, he said the, the issue isn't so much that sometimes we have to pay off a debt or not. The issue is how we look at it. The one who can take tragedy and turn it into opportunity is the one who wins. Okay. Is it take your, take your feelings out of it. If you can find a tragedy, that means there's a vacuum. Something's missing. And if you can find a way to capitalize on putting that thing back, you've created the better mousetrap. And all the mice will come, come eating at your door. So I look at all of these all these all these brothers who they make it and they come back and they want to give houses here or they want to give books over here or they want to put in a clothing store here or they want to put in restaurants over here okay uh, that's cool I mean it's better to have that than not to have it but you're just feeding the problem If we look at what's missing and we go back and see that as our next business opportunity and capitalize on it, well, you've now installed infrastructure in a place where there was none. 
and it is now in the vested interest of the people that you put in place because now that's how they acquire their bread and butter. And now you've given them a reason to continue your work. You give somebody something that they didn't work for, what are they going to do? They're going to squander it. They're yeah. going to tear it apart. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You put in another fast food restaurant, after a while, they stop seeing that it's an Anglo, that, that it's an Afrocentric name across the top. All they see is this fried chicken again. And they're going to tear it apart. Right. Um, you put in a school. It's still in the same type of, it's the same system. The people still have to be certified by the same board of education. The education still has the, the, the books and everything that the education you provide still has to be provided by. So unless it's theirs and they're having to work for it or buy into it, they're going to tear it apart. They're not going to see it. They're not going to appreciate it. So there has to be, and I hate to sound like this, but if there's a way you can capitalize on them, It'll stay. This is America. You, you better sound like that. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know, if there's if there's a way that if there's a way you can take advantage of them, and that sounds harsh, but I mean, if you take like the the analogy we had about the socks the other day, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, if you can, you know, in if you can buy an old football field, an old an old school, and on it's got a football field, you could tear that football field apart. And then you can tell all, all the brothers and all the sisters on, on the corner, look, stop hustling for nickels and dimes. Come over here, till this piece of land. I'm going to give you $50 a day. They know $50 a day don't count for nothing. But they also know that when the chips are down, they can come to you and make $50 that day. And their chips are going to be down because yeah. they ain't doing shit with themselves. Right, right. So their chips are going to be down. So here they come, and you can sit there and say, all right, check you off, choop, go ahead, take your $50, and check you off, choop, nah, 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 you can't come in here, go back, try that again, next one, come up, okay, and they'll make that little $50 that day, and what are you going to do, you're going to package their labor, you're going to make your socks, you're going to do the whole thing, as you're now, they're not going to see none of that, but I guarantee you, they won't let the next man burn your place down, nah, nah, don't, don't, no, no, leave that man alone, They're those yeah. good people. Right. They look out for me. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um man, I loved both your answers so much, man. Like especially um the way you and Trey both echoed each other in different directions. Um It's it's like, man, it's so it's it's a, it's a real weird junk's position in my brain every time I think about social issues because I'm a business guy, right? And uh, a hardcore businessman is a cannibalistic, like furious animal, you know, at, at mm -hmm. the core of who he is. Like mm -hmm. there's just something in me that goes, man, poverty is one of the best business models in the world. Hey, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because I get to do unto you whatever I want and I know you can't. There you go. If you can't do jack back. It's the, it's nothing, the fully business model. Like Nothing breeds opportunity better than desperation. And I, and I know you need what I need because mm -hmm. I know you have not. And all I have mm -hmm. to do is supply it at substandard rate. Tell my, my wife was showing me this video of an affordable housing guy, right? Affordable housing group. And they were building affordable houses and a black contractor rolled up on one of their structures and just went ballistic. He was like, what the hell are you gonna do with this wood? The wood ain't even treated. It's gonna rot. The house you buying is about to rot. And I mean, he was, he was going ballistic. And it was like, okay. But that is a level of specialized knowledge that most people in our community don't have, don't want, don't need, because it's not going to make them anything. And how do you now, in, how do you now say that to somebody who's like, well, hell, they gave me a house. You gave me a bunch of problems with my house. You know what? Fuck you. I'd rather have my house than your problems. <laughs> Shit, I, you know <laughs> that's why poverty is such a great business model the impoverished people fight to keep the poverty cycle going mm -hmm. even if I'm trying to educate you that it's a trap the mouse is like fuck you nigga I want to get the cheese but it's a trap you're going to die fuck that trap 
I'm getting the cheese. And he, no, the cheese is not real. The cheese is an illusion. Plop. And he he's much more happy just jumping in the truck. Yeah, mm-hmm. look at the prison system. Nigga, I've been to prison mm-hmm. six times. Nigga, what rat brags about getting caught in the trap mm-hmm. six times? Nigga, I've never met a rat that was like, nigga, I got caught in the trap six times, nigga. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm an OG yep. at this shit. I'm a, yeah, there you go. I'm an OG. I earned mine. What did you earn, stupid? <laughs> no. yep. And, yep. and when I look at that from a business standpoint, I'm like, I can't do it. Like, my heart is just like, nah, I can't do it. But it's like, it's a lot of different businesses. I'm just like, man, these niggas eat this shit up. But I feel terrible, yo, because it's a distraction. It's nothing that's needed, and it'll make me a lot of money, but it wouldn't really make me feel good about it. All right, so here's my answer to that. Here's my answer to that. You remember Ramon, right? Ramon Rodriguez? I'll never forget Ramon. I don't think anybody, whoever knew him, will ever forget him. (laughs) Man, that was one shrewd businessman. Let's call it. I don't think anyone who ever knew him will ever forget him. This is a lesson he taught me, and, and he had his ways, and you just had to accept him the way he was. But here's the thing. Check it out now. This man built one of the first um, health and fitness complexes in Orangeburg. He didn't build just a gym. He built a complex. He did. On one side of it was the gym, complete with all the vitamins and and supplements and the, the spa and the sauna health and yep. health shakes, the whole nine. Walk down a piece in that same complex, what are you going to find? A restaurant? Nope. He had a club. <laughs> oh, you talking about the first joint? Okay. Yeah, the early Ramon. Hey. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. How, well, he, how he got him to that now. He had a club he, with a right? targeted right? demographic. Okay. So he had he sold you alcohol at night on one side, and a fitness center gym on the other side. On the other side during the day. Oh, during the day. Okay, this man hustled both sides of the fence, and he knew exactly what he was doing. Now, unbeknownst to a lot of people, if you walked a little further down that complex, there was a string of buildings back then. What was that? That was the after gym establishment. That was the after the night club establishment. So oh, you had the gym, yeah. then you had the 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 the, the club. club, and then you had the after club establishment. Okay. <laughs> Complete with all of the people necessary to make an establishment like that work. Yeah. He was employing people. Yeah. He employed a lot of people. He definitely did. He definitely did. You know did. what I mean? And he was all about enterprising. He would find a piece of property. He would purchase it. Tax lien purchase. Mm-hmm. Put a fence around it. Put some turf around it. Gut it out. Put some lights in it. Put in a couple poles. A sound system. Bang. Business. Cool. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know what I'm saying? And 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 on a good hot summer, he could turn out anywhere between three to seven thousand dollars a night. I noticed because I was the one making sure nobody jumped him. Man, <laughs> man I remember one night Ramon Club. Um, so another thing he did, this is a great example too, Sifu. He was a rental property owner. So yeah. Um, yeah. He married into a family that had some established wealth and some properties. And um, matter of fact, his father-in-law lived across the street from me when I was in Orangeburg the first time. Mm-hmm. And his mm-hmm. father-in-law was a shrewd businessman. His father-in-law yes, owned a home with two basements and rented out underneath his house. Mm-hmm. And rented out the building behind his house. These mm-hmm. were not houses these were just structures like i just mean structures. just like it's like a little man cave and he was the, and he every month he could throw up a sheetrock wall so quick <laughs> i mean he would he, he would he would change it would be like lego blocks that's the way he looked at it i mean he would change 
he would change the inside structure of that doggone building. You walk in like, wait a minute. I know there was a door right here. Just last week, there was a door right here. And he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. That was always like, <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So there's nothing stopping us from doing that and meeting the needs of the people where we are. Now I watched him. I watched him take that from that type of hustle, where he literally took advantage of the people where they were, all the way up to the level where he was taking all of the business coming in, turning it into credit accounts, so that he could pull um, a four hundred thousand dollar loan off and put up um, an apartment complex. Yeah, 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 yeah. He did it from the bottom. He didn't need the money. He just needed to show that he that he that he, that he could stand for the credit of four hundred thousand dollars. He didn't need four hundred thousand dollars cash. And I watched him hustle that together. The man, when it came to business, he was shrewd and he was on point. Now he cut a lot of corners, but he met the need where it was, and he grew from it. And and you know what? The only person who cared about him cutting the corners was the people who were outside judging him. The people that he was making money off, and him, he himself, were fine. As long as it didn't fall on anybody's mm-hmm. head, he was good. Mm-hmm. I remember a dude got hurt at one of Ramon's spots. Man, Ramon took that man outside. I think Ramon might have handed that man two hundred fifty dollars, and that was it. No lawsuit. That was it. No nothing. Man, no lawsuit. No nothing. He knew people. Man, he knew. It was it was almost like watching a, a Puerto Rican Don King. I mean, uh, he. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he just knew how to. I mean, how to he's the only dude. He's the only dude I ever saw, and I'm not kidding. Settle payroll with some hot wings. <laughs> yes, that's what Ramones. You know what I mean? Settle payroll with some hot wings, and I'm sitting here looking at the dude. Now the dude's sitting there just tearing down the hot wings, and I'm like, "Yo, man, you don't see you what's owe happening." Three hundred dollars, homie. He owes you, you know, three hundred dollars. Hey, you just let him off for a basket of hot wings and some French fries, and you just, and you sitting there happy about it. All I could do was just just shake my head and walk away. It's like, all right, damn, okay. You know, per- <laughs> perfect example, Sifu. Perfect example, man. Like, I think. To be a businessman in, in the economy that we live in, the country that we live, is not necessarily half-assing or cutting corners as a practice. It's meeting the need where it is and doing what you have to do to scale. And I don't think a lot, there of, you people, go. A lot of people, I know for me, that was one of my worst traits. There you go. I had to have it perfect before I did anything. And I learned very quickly on, like, oh, no, that's not going to work. You don't have the you money. You just got to do it. Yeah, just you don't have the money it. to get it perfect. You got to go. Just do it. And I realized one of the other things I realized from running the store that Ramon and George Dean owned down mm-hmm. here, nobody cared. Like people was just like, oh, you got it? I was like, yeah, I got it. But you know, this is, no, nah, I, I don't care. I was like, whoa, I'm about to cheat myself out of a sale. Like, you know, nobody cared. As long as you had the item they were looking for, it was affordable. It was a wrap. Make your money. And if, and if you, and I hate to say this, but if you give Hood a way to act ignorant, Man, I had they're a, gonna bring you. They're gonna bring you their money. I had a pool hall. I was selling cell phones you know before Boost Mobile. Like, yeah, you we understand? Was we was getting. They're gonna, they're gonna give you the money. Um, shoot, I can't. I can't tell you how many how many nights I was in there pushing clothing. We're just gonna call it clothing. You know what I mean? And <laughs> all you do is put up the lights and a piece of carpet and call it a red. Call it a red carpet. You know what I'm saying? Competition. Here you go. Yo. You know, hundred dollars to the best, and all it was was if you had less on, then you won. That's it. <laughs> Get oh my goodness started. Yo, I mean, <laughs> now you brought back. I'm glad you brought up that example. Yo, get started. That's really all he get did. Get started. Nobody do else it. was doing nothing. People were bored. He saw opportunity, and then I remember he actually somebody actually came in and was like, "Yo, you can't do this like this in this spot." It wasn't two weeks later, he had another spot 
on the outskirts of town where the city limits didn't matter. I mean, and literally bought the spot. Like, if this is the city You saw that, right? And this yeah. is the county limit. He yeah. was this far away. I mean, he bought yeah. the spot right on the other side of the city limit yep. and jumped it off. Yep. Made more money. Yep. I remember his son told me one night they made like 18 grand just off alcohol. Because mm -hmm. now he was pulling cats from the city, but now the country boys who lived out that way started coming because they didn't have anything to do. Great example, see. Well, I appreciate that one, man. That's that's starting from the ground up and building something. Now, people may laugh at this story. Um, God bless Ramon. He passed. Um, all of his children are better off, uh, not having to work for anyone. And uh him, his wife, his children, and his all his heirs are still running his business enterprises to this day. Mm -hmm. So you can laugh all about you know how janky he was or how shady he was, but that man left his family in a position that most men don't have the opportunity to leave their family in. So at last count, and I haven't been in the middle of the family for years now. We had we had our own little issue, and I backed away just to you know leave it at that. But at last count, he 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 finished with a net worth of at least three and a half million dollars. I can believe it. At least. I can believe that easy. You know? So and this is a guy in, in Orangeburg. In, in Orangeburg, Orangeburg, South Carolina. I mean hit the in crux Orangeburg, South right, right here in a right here. black community. Mm -hmm. In Orangeburg. With a net worth with a net worth of more, more than three and a half, because just the property now, Correct. the way the property's built up, the property is worth more than three million now. Correct. Because I and and let's not forget, you know, the reason I was confused about the club, he actually now owns not only the entire complex, but he actually owned and built uh several rows of complexes mm -hmm. behind him, all of which just about have tenants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, yep. so, he and, so and, it be lotted to commercial real estate. So exactly, exactly, exactly. So I mean, yeah, so easily, easily. Five six million easily, correct. Yeah, correct. Hey man, great great point, man. Great point. Um, so the question that has been burning, like, and this is a question that I it, it keeps me up sometimes just thinking about it, man. My brother is uh not one but one of many, and if Dre was on, he'd be concurring this, and Hassan was on, he'd probably concur this too. But there is a school of thought out there that is saying that, hey, look, man, the reason why most of our leaders, you know, and the people who are supposedly the role models in our community are not giving back is because they can't. As a condition of their wealth, they are people who are barring them from being able to truly to contribute to the community. And I'll give you an example. Um, as long as Robert Kraft has been alive, you've never really heard anything negative about him except that he makes too much money. And um, the moment he starts to support social justice with Meek Mills, he gets caught up in a prostitute scandal. Um, Robert Smith, black billionaire, bought the college debt of an entire graduating class at Morehouse and then paid their <coughs> families' homes off I remember that. Completely eliminate two generations of debt in one move. I remember that, yeah. Two billion dollar tax scandal now. Um, had to just recently settle that um, because of him violating those rules. And a lot of people um, who are of that school of thought are like, well, those are the things that you see happen when you start to trigger the, the wealth rules. You got to understand for society to exist, it has to be a poor class. It has to be a poor class that's, that people leech off of. That's the chain of society. And that division keeps everybody's eyes off the wealth. For society to exist or for capitalism to exist? Well, so that is a very, very interesting concept though, Trey, because society itself is going to exist without money. Society would exist without anything. But for the society that we see in America to exist, if you do not have a poor class and a rich class, then America is actually now constrained and challenged because mm -hmm. the foundation that we live under in America now is founded on free labor. 
Mm, so I'm gonna disagree was, with you. Know, I'm 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 gonna disagree with you, Khaled, and, and I'm gonna disagree with you a little bit, but I'm but I'm gonna agree with Trey. So so um, finish, I'm 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 gonna I'm, I'm, I'm agree with Trey with the premise of Trey's question, but go ahead. No, I'm 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 gonna finish the thought. The thought is more so around that. So if you look at the economies of the world, the greatest economies in the world were centered around taking, beating, and lynching and using free labor to prop up the country. These were not producing societies. Like, there's no gold in Britain. There's no diamonds in Britain. There's no ore in Britain. Can't make steel out of Britain. So all these things have now been imported from other societies to build the wealth. When you look at America, much of the same and the free labor. So in order for these societies to truly exist, there has to be someone we can take from to prop up our wealth. It's gotta be somebody we can exploit to make the money. I mean, you said it best. There's no better business model than exploitation when you don't have to pay the people that are doing the work. It's, no it's, it's so money. wickedly, it's so wickedly, uh, it's almost sensual how easy it must be to sit at the top and just go, I'm selling low budget toilet tissue to prisons, schools, Title I <laughs> schools, and, um, <laughs> and, 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 and poor, poor uh, VA hospitals. I'm the toilet tissue man. And you don't have no, you can't even buy your own toilet tissue, and I got the government contract to supply you with toilet. Say that. And I know somebody that's gonna make sure I got this contract the entire time. Mm -hmm. So that I'm, I'm I'm contributing to that campaign every year, buddy. He's not going nowhere. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> so when you look at the construct of that, you, you gotta understand that if somebody is disrupting that ecosystem, disrupting that poverty chain there's a huge domino effect that comes that from the fall away of you being able to now to be self-sustaining. Because if you don't need my low budget cheap goods anymore, or if you don't need the service that I'm giving to you that is substandard, that's my business model. It costs me too much money to give you a quality good. I've never ever, ever set my business up to give you a quality good. I can't even, I don't even know how to do that. I have to redo my entire infrastructure in order to produce a quality good to give you. So okay, that's so where the thought process comes in of like, man, is there really a group that is centered to keep other black people from helping other black people rise? And that is, you know, just kind of the question that I asked you. Do you guys believe there is a, you know, there is, is an organization or organizations that are centered to attack people who try to help black people rise? Economically, anyway. I'm not one given to conspiracy theories, so I'm going to say just out of out of principle, I don't think it's a black thing. Okay. Um, but to 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 go back to your toilet tissue um, analogy, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the prisons the toilet tissue, I'm a, and 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 the, the the toilet tissue, the soap, the toothbrushes, the combs, because that's really where I get a lot of my industry, my money from. Mm -hmm. That's where I get the bulk of my money from. And on the other end to the populace, I'm going to give them shows like The Price is Right, Jeopardy, and Family Feud to confuse and excite the masses. Because, you know, no one ever asks where that $20,000 come from that I just won. All they know is they just won it. So they're going to they're gonna keep supporting me. Meanwhile, I just locked up your cousin and now I have him making furniture for Spriggs because Spriggs is going to buy a couch that a prisoner made and that couch costs $25 but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send that couch and, and, and a thousand more of them to Big Lots and call it a discount product and I'm going to sell it for $800 and then I'm going to take that $800 and maybe 10% of it goes back into the pot that I'm going to give away on the Price is Right again or name that feud a family feud or whatever. So there is the system to it. You're right. Um, is there a part of it that make, that makes sure that we can't dig too deep into the structure of the system and upset it? I don't think that. No, I don't think that. I will say, 
I do think that when an individual raises their head up, you do have trolls who just start digging and start looking. You do have that. But I think that's just part of the, the system that we have. Because um, at that moment, he was newsworthy. So who found the story? Who, who initiated the, the look into his taxes to find that, you know, something was amiss? Why did they do that? Until then, he wasn't newsworthy, so there was no need to look into it. But there's always going to be a troll looking for something if you raise your head up. Um, gotcha. gotcha. And I'm, I'm not saying that that's the truth. I'm just saying that's, that's the most that I can make sense of. You know what I mean? But I, I'm, not, I'm not given to conspiracy theories. You know, so I'm not, I don't think that there's, that there's an evil cabal out there waiting. Oh, wait. No, no. He's helping the black man. Let's go after him. Let's destroy him. Because a lot of the times we do it to ourselves. You know, you know, a lot of t- <laughs> a lot of times we're our worst enemies. But yeah, I remember him doing that, and I didn't know until you just said it about the tax the tax troubles that he had. I didn't know that you know, either. I, I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, that that's actually uh last month's scoop on him, man. That's he's been fighting that for about a month now, and you know, settled it very quickly. Um, so you know, it is what it is. Yeah, you know, but the thing is, he could settle it, right. You know, I mean, that, that's like that's like somebody from the IRS going after, uh, um, what's my man? Um, nah, uh, uh, um, old fella that does all, all he does now is just purchase companies and revamp them and push them back out again. Oh, Warren, his name. Warren Buffett. Yeah. You know, nobody tax law going after Warren. Right. You know? Yeah, that's a career after, you know, man. Like, you know, you lose you know your career going after Warren Buffett. Man. You know, you go out, they go after Warren. He said, This company didn't pay what company? I don't own that no more. What's wrong with you? <laughs> 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 yeah, he got rid of the whole company. They, they don't exist no more. Yeah. You know? Go ahead, Trey, uh, man. I'm, I'm kind of curious, Sifu. Appreciate your perspective, Trey. How do you feel about it, man? Man, so it's, I'm torn. I'm torn, dog, because, you know, like, I'm not giving to conspiracy theories either, but we have real proof that there are people that are out there that are trying, like, that try to destroy movements. Like, that was a real guy. We have proof that he was out here trying to destroy movements. What would you say the name? Jay Egger. So, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's like, mm. I know that's a real person. I know that really happened. So, I mean, and I probably, and at the time when people were probably saying like, man, J. Edgar Hoover is out here trying to um, squash this movement, keeping tabs on everybody, uh, labeling them um, terrorist organizations. People was like, man, what? Okay, but let's, let's, get in, let's get into Hoover's head for a second though. And I'm not defending him at all. Trust me, I'm not, okay? But um, you said something earlier um, where you were talking about is it economics or is it society? So mm. society, if you look at society as a thing, it exists through commerce. That is society. Break it all the way down to its, to its basic barest elements. Society only exists through commerce. Otherwise, I have no reason to deal with you. I don't want you looking at my wife. I don't want you staring at my daughters. I don't want you looking at my green piece of grass thinking it's yours. We got no reason to deal with each other other than the fact that you got blue rocks over there and I got sticks over here. That's the only reason that we have to sit next to each other. So I'm going to trade you some of my sticks. You're going to trade me some of your blue rocks. Money over there is going to give me some of his salt. This one over here is going to to let me have access to some of his fruit. Okay? So commerce is the only reason we have society. Other than that, we're all looking over our fences, sharpening our spears. That being said, um, Mr. Hoover was looking at a country trying to defend us this very fragile thing that we were working on against a country who was essentially larger than we were with more resources and bigger guns and he was like at any given moment they're going to be here 
he really did fear a red wave. And where's the easiest way for an enemy to get into you? He looks to your dissidents. And who's the largest dissident class that we have? A whole bunch of brown people pissed off because for generations we've been denying them their full rights. So all of a sudden, these people start to organize, they start reading laws, and they start realizing, oh, wait a minute, if we all come together under the Constitution, we can actually stand up for ourselves and we have some leverage. Hoover's vibe is like, yo, who paid them to do that? Who gave them the money to do that? Who's giving them the instruction to do that? Nah, they didn't do that on their own. Because remember, at the end of the day, people revere people like Roosevelt. Roosevelt was a straight up racist. Okay? Yes, he was tactical genius. Theodore, yes. Theodore Roosevelt, right? Yes, yes, Theodore Roosevelt. Yes, I mean, if you if you read his chronicles, when it comes to organizational structure and, and social management, off the chain, he was. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he's a racist. Okay? Not, no, but he no was a straight up racist, okay? No so what was their, I mean, straight up, how did they see us? Did they see us as intellectual equals? No, we're barely out of the damn tree, scratching under our armpits. So they didn't see us as having the capacity, the intellectual capacity to read a document, understand what it meant, and then organize around a principle and stand up for itself. No, you didn't see that. So same thing, here's Hoover. Now he's been given this great power, he's been given a brand new organization, and he has nothing really to point it at. What's he gonna point it at, McCarthy? McCarthy's already doing his dirt. So who's he gonna point it at, the KKK? Nah, we're not worried about them. They're keeping them. They're keeping the rabble straight down south. The KKK was as organized as they were at that time because of Hoover. Who do you have to work on? The biggest threat that they could see was organization and the coming together of the civil rights organization. So they wanted to see who was in there. So yeah, they infiltrated. Now the thing that really pisses me off is people didn't see the trap when it was laying for them. And you just come in, come on, man, ain't no poppy plants growing in Harlem. You know what I mean? So where's all this heroin coming from? You know what I mean? Just blocks and blocks and blocks of people just wasted on this stuff. You know? My question to you on this, though, is what makes that situation any different than what it is today, though? So, like, if they're saying, like, oh, man, back in the day, Black people are the biggest uh, threat to national security. If you want to destroy a, com a country, you target their dissonance, then what's to say that they're not still doing that same thing? Whenever you start giving the Black people, whenever you start realizing, oh, man, like, we have power, once you start, Robert Smith decided, like, oh, man, like, I'm about to, as Cali put it, I'm about to wipe out two generations of, of, of debt. I'm about to put the young people that just graduated from this, this, this institution that I revere and I'm about to put them in a situation where they're now they, they're able to play on a level playing field with those that um, like- They do can, go to school without, without any debt or any debt structure, making them, forcing them into a job or a position that, that may be underneath right. them just to be able mm -hmm. to erase the debt. Mm -hmm. you know, the right, then, so you're putting, them on, you're putting them on par with like the white folks that like are able to go back to live with their parents or their parents were able to fully fund their education or whatever the case may be, you you drastically change their their trajectory because you you mm -hmm. they might start from as low. So so real mm -hmm. quick though, real real quick. I can say I believe in organizations like that. I, I'm a bit of a conspiracy theorist, but I also understand organized effort in protecting self-interest. So mm -hmm. I know what I would do to you if you were trying to take food out of my family's mouth on a street level. I know what I would do to you on an economic level, but I can imagine being a billionaire and I'm going, huh, these cats actually think they could, you know, create a movement that's gonna stop what I'm doing. Poor souls. And yeah, you know, well, you know, businessmen were monsters though, dog. So what do you think? They you don't think they got street tactics? I mean, nah, it's it's, it's not even street tactics. It's it's it's, it's self-interest, man. Like you so I guess I guess the way that I'm thinking about it is is that after you graduate from the street, you like, okay, I always will have those tactics. Some of the biggest street dudes became the biggest business owners. 
Right. But if you look at it, it's kind of like every street dude who was able to excel at some point, it was through self-interest. It's like, hey, here I was able to align everything that met my self-interest and I was able to accelerate past my competition. I was able to outgrow everybody, outpace everybody, outwork everybody, whatever it took. I was going to do that to meet my self-interest and to turn around and now create a structure, even a social justice movement that's going to erode my economic base. You're going to tear away from my customers. It's not necessarily a conspiracy. It's just in my self-interest to make sure that doesn't happen. It's in my best self-interest to co-opt your movement and stop what you're doing because it's going to hurt me and mine. It, but that is thinking it's strictly self interest. I may not even be a racist. I just can't let you erode my economic base. I can't it, let you do it. But conspiracy is, and, and the and the annotation of it as in conspiring against those people is what it is. It's I mean, corporations co corporations conspire against each other. It's corporate espionage going on every single day of the week. Exactly. I mean, there are corporations who pay Russians to come over and hack their competition and shut their system down for a few days. They get that much of an edge before the end of the quarter. I mean, this is this is a country that, again, is only defined by your access to certain things. Once you have access and exposure on certain levels, your reality starts to change. You're like, oh, okay, then. This ain't a conspiracy theory. This is an everyday way of life for these motherfuckers. They not. They not. They don't, they don't consider this conspiracy. This is business tactics. So that, that was the other part of what I was saying, though. So, like, I, I don't, I'm not on that level to be able to see it. So, like, I, I know that, like, man, like, these sort of things have happened before with Jay Edgar. I also know that, like, man, like, it makes sense for, like, if you, like, protecting your self-interest to do these sort of things. But, like, I can't wrap my, my mental around that because, like, I'm not in a position to be conspiring with nobody to be, like, I don't got nothing that, like, I'm able to protect on no malicious level like that, except right. for when you brought it back to, like, a, like, on the street sense, like, man, like, like people say it all the time, like man, like sorry for you. You come in my house, right? My right. Okay. All right. I, I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Well, I think part of the issue is that we're looking at the dude at the top and saying he's the one looking all the way down on the street and scheming for what's happening down there. And I really don't think it happens that way. Sure. I think at at every level you have you have various strata that go up that go up the ladder, right? So if we look at crack coming into the neighborhood at around right, the 1980s, right, 1980s, 90s, the dude that brought the crack in, that, that cooked it up and started disseminating it, the dude that paid him, he wasn't the one all the way up at the top. He didn't get his orders from the guy all the way up at the top. You know, he was all the way down, he, he's down there with him. So where did the order come from? If you watch the movie and he tells you how it happened, he, said he was sitting in his bedroom, sitting in his, in his, in his living room, Somebody came and knocked on the door and said, hey, you the weed man. I got a new product for you. This is how you do it. And he said they sat in his house for weeks mm -hmm. with a chemist explaining to him how to do this. Yeah. Okay. So who is the guy above him? Where did the stuff come from? Well, a lot of it came from Colombia, Vietnam, Venezuela, all them places. It came in. Okay. So who decided to turn it into crack? Why did they do it? What was the purpose behind it? He didn't come up with, with the formula for crack. All he knew was this was them telling him, you're going to make a whole lot of money. And they didn't even tell him at the end of the day they were going to arrest him. But he knew when they came to get him, he knew the game was over. Yeah. Black people right? ain't <laughs> black people <laughs> planes. Black people ain't, black people ain't started this, man. Like, and I feel, no, I feel you know? like that with a critical thinking eye, you understand that black people weren't like the like the initiators of the crack mm -hmm. epidemic. Nope. Like, nope. How, how, did, but, how did you do this? But I guarantee you, um, Oliver North, who was all the way at the top of this thing, he wasn't the one looking at that man in his house telling him to go do that. He didn't do that. No, he didn't. So who gave him Who gave him the instructions to do that? So all the way down, down there on the ground level, there's different folks with their own motivations doing things, and all they know is because they have resources and they have... They have their own agendas, so to speak. They have their own agendas. And I hate to use the term they because there's a name, an individual did this. An individual did this thing and that individual has a name. And what was that individual's reason for doing it? 
the problem that we have is that it happens so friggin' often. Every time you turn around, there's another dude taking advantage in the same way, exploiting us for the same weakness. So what's the commonality? Somebody's taking advantage of that same weakness. And now you got Hindis on the corner taking advantage of the same weakness, maybe in a different way, but taking advantage of the exact same weakness. So, so, it, so, so real quick though, Sifu, I, I guess the, the, the question that I, I kind of want to hear you answer, and you've actually already answered a good bit of it. Succinctly, um, if I am benefiting from that, Hindus, Chinese, whatever. Like I said, it may not even be racially motivated. It's in my own best interest to make sure you don't get out of that trap, though. Economically. That, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, um, just recently read Mark, Mark Zuckerberg's, um, one of his higher ups who left the company wrote a very interesting um, memo and actually testified against Facebook in their congressional hearings. And they said, you know, Facebook is actually a monopoly because it doesn't matter what you start. If it gains any popularity, they buy you. If they can't buy you, they'll buy your staff. They will cheat you. They will come after you. They will sign contracts with you with advertising dollars and not pay you for months and months and months, hoping to starve your company and to break your company. They literally spend every day figuring out how to break their competition. Because at a certain level, there's nothing else for you to do. You're, you're really just thinking, how do I now sustain my greatness? Yep. And if there's an opposing empire or a nice rival upstart, if there's a Jesus Christ running around here, stirring up the good people while I'm sitting on my throne, it's, it, it's, it's just in my best interest to make sure I can maintain my throne. So I guess I'm looking at it from the lens of, if, if I am the man at the top, then what is my biggest worry? Is my biggest worry the systems of things that go on underneath me? Yeah, the unknowns are there, but I can't control that. I can control the guy that I know is gunning for me, or I can control the systems that I know that can tear down my throne. And that's what I got to aim at. That's, that's where my focus needs to be. So I guess what I'm asking you, Sifu, is you know, let's, let's tear down the conspiracy theory because that was probably a bad way to frame it. But if you are sitting at the top of a throne right now and somebody is doing something to destabilize your kingdom, you, you almost have to kill them, don't you? Yeah. Or give them position. Because they can't overthrow no. you. They sign. They no. sign. No, because this is one thing I learned in doing business with and, and doing business with, with, with young black men. I've always found them harder to do business with than, than sisters. Um, mm -hmm. Sisters will take construction. Mm -hmm. Sisters, especially sisters who are intelligent and are confident in their intelligence, if you point them in a direction and say, use your creativity and, and, and help me achieve this goal, if they feel good about what they're doing, they will do just that. And you will be the wiser to take advantage of that and reap the benefit. Young black man, however, at the heart of every young black man who knows his worth is a king just waiting to come out. And he will at some point cut your Achilles tendon. It is in his nature. Even if all he does is see you at a weak point and walk away with your property, he's going to do it at some point. That's just his nature. So you saying like the 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 young lion cub, after he gets to a certain age, he got to leave the pride. He got to go. He get he get he get to a certain age. You you you. I mean now now if he has some sense, y'all can shake hands. You can do like Abraham did. Send him out to another piece of land way 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 way, way over there on the other side of the world, and we can converse with you know smokestacks and pigeons you know, you, know, we, you know we can converse that way you know and, and keep the peace between us but at some point yeah you got to send him packing because if not he gonna come for the throne if not he gonna come for the throne 
because he got he got his own agenda, and they never tell you what their own what their agenda is. They never tell you. Half the time, they don't even know when they first start. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I had one young man with me, and we and we actually got the, that project up and running off the ground. And, and then it was his wife at home who lit the bug in him. Why are you doing that with him? Don't you see the success he's making? Why are you da, da, da? you can't do this for yourself? You can't do it. And 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 the, and the man came and told me. He was like, "Look, man, my wife is saying these things." He said, "But I told her, I said, why are you why are you upset that I'm helping this man? If I can help him reach his dream, then in, then in that way he can help me reach mine." And when he said that, it occurred to me, oh, damn, he got a dream. And if he don't wake up and realize what it is, his wife going to shove it in his nose. But he got one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nah, man, that, that's, um, that's, that's, that's true in a lot of sense, man. I think the, the dynamic of employee and and partnership um, in business, just especially with our people is number one, I've had a lot more success working with females, white men, white women. I've had a lot more success working with any other person than another black man. That's just real. Yeah, for real. I mean, I just, just in terms of rapid success, growth and sustainability, working with another brother can be extremely, extremely difficult if you guys are both going after the same thing because you have two different ways of approaching it, two different ways of looking at it. I want it to be X, you want it to be Z. Now, what I have found is that if, like you said, if I know what your goal is and we talk about what our goals are and our jumping off points and hey, here's what I'm in it for, as long as we know why we're together, that usually keeps the relationship somewhat stable. There is always a little postulating that you know, a little posturing that goes on. A little, a little chest comes out, you know, every now and again. But it's like, okay, well, your chest is out because this is what you know you do. And your chest should be out. You're a talent at what you know you do. And when it's my turn, my chest comes out because here's what I do well. You know, here's what I know mm -hmm. I do. And that usually keeps the relationship balanced. But like you said, usually when brothers are working together, they're excited about the idea and they're not really talking about what they want out of it. And usually when you ask them, hey, bro, what you want out of this, man? What you, oh man, I'm just here to help you, man. You know, I'm just here with you, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, I like the idea, I like the concept. I want to do something for the people. But that's not really his true agenda. Mm -mm. A lot of times his agenda is not necessarily even to do anything for the people. It's just to have people see him appearing to do something for the people. <laughs> and, and you know, poverty pimps, man, are usually, you know, a, a lot a lot of poverty pimps are your own people. Mm. So, I mean, I agree with you on that subset, man. But as we kind of just transition, last question of the night, man, and this one's going to be a little bit different. Um, in terms of us actually coming together, moving the needle forward, starting small, grinding, pushing, whatever we have together, why is it that we don't seem to believe that it is possible for us to get going without the outside influence, help or support of people outside of our community. And I'll tell you where the question comes from. It's pretty deep because the, 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 the man, man, the Ramon, just that whole Ramon segment, just it, it, it really helped this question kind of shine through a little bit more. People believe that the black community is broke. And I've been telling so many, I mean, there's actually a brother who recently wrote a book and I'll share it with you guys. And he's actually talking about, hey, black wealth is actually a myth. There's really no black wealth like that, especially not in compared to your white counterparts. And when you look at how much black people make through this Department of Labor and Statistics, that's not even enough to sustain themselves. So where is this so-called economic black support coming from? this so-called rule of 16. You don't have enough money to even participate in the rule of 16. Not in a way that is truly meant to participate in. Rule of 16 is for somebody who wants to sit down with 16 different people that have different industries, but they may want to buy a hotel together. So they'll actually buy from each other and increase each other's cash stack and then take the money and profits from each business and go buy that hotel as a collective. That's how a lot of people believe that collective economics are practiced. 
for spe specific strategic investments. But since you don't have your own country, black man, and you don't have your own communities like that, then how do you actually do collective economics? You really can't because you are always going to buy something from somebody who doesn't look like you. So why is it now that you're seeing this big push for a black collective and black economics, but we don't have an infrastructure to support that? Even if I bought something from you, Trey, if I use PayPal, you know, I just kind of gave away, you know, I gave away my percentages to somebody who doesn't look like me. So the question is, you know, do we really have an infrastructure in place that allows us to be supportive of one another? So I'm going to call it back to what Sifu said earlier. Sifu answered the first question with just get started, right? So I think that in order for us to be able to get to that point, we got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And like a part of the issue with um, like why it's difficult for black people you know, to like do this together and think that we got to bring somebody else into it is, is part of partially about what uh, y'all just talked about just now in the last segment. Like, man, like it's difficult to work with us because we don't always be like, forthright with what our intentions are or maybe we don't rec naturally recognize what our intentions are or like we might come in thinking like our value is this and then we all of a sudden start smelling ourselves and realizing like oh man i'm a little bit more valuable than i initially thought i was right and then it's like man like my intentions have changed and i need to like i need to to pivot i need to do more mm -hmm. so it, it's not necessarily a situation where it's like, oh man, like it's not, I don't think it's not something that could happen. And like, yeah, we might at the, like, <clears throat> honestly, if we buy from anybody at this point, you're going to pay PayPal. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to, if you're going to pay PayPal anyway, you might as well pay the black person. That's going to eventually, if, if they focus on paying somebody else, that's going to be a black person and PayPal going to get their percentage. Cool. PayPal going to get theirs regardless. Let PayPal get theirs. But instead of letting PayPal get theirs and the white person that's getting paid off of paypal getting theirs give it to the black person because then that's how the collective economics works yeah and i mean and, and again i love the answer bro because it's like um get started and actually do participate don't don't use the fact that it's not a perfect participation as an excuse not to participate but exactly. I, I love the way you answered that question um seafood for you man same question brother like you know are we able to truly support each other? And again, why does it feel like we have to go outside of our communities to be able to do something that is substantial, so something that's real? We seem like we have to impress white people. Because we do. Give it to me. That's the short answer. We do. We got to go outside. We don't have it inside. We don't have the structure inside. Gotcha. And if we, don't have the, if we don't have the structure inside, then we got to go outside to get it. I mean, we're just just simply put, if we were to take the first idea that we came up with, we're going to go um, find uh, a tax lien property. Number one, the taxes are not owed to me. The taxes are not owed to you. The taxes are owed to the state. So we got to take a little bit of money, a little bit of sea money we got together. We got to scratch that together. We all got to go down, pay our little money to register so we can all be agents. So we can all have a look, even, even to look at the doggone books. We got it. We got it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not our ball game, people. We don't own the Monopoly board. Neither one of us' last name is Hasbro. Thanks. So, you know, if, if I'm going to pass your go and, and I'm going to get your $200, I got to play your game by your rules. And that's not to say that eventually we, we, we let's say, let's say we get the first one. And we scratch the, scratch the money together. We're not even going to go to the brother on the corner that we know can do renovations and pay him to do it. Right. Nah, we're going to go find, you know, Mr. Fix-It down the road who's licensed and insured because if he screws something up, we're going to need to sue him and get my money back. Exactly. You know, so we do. We have to. But that doesn't mean that we got to stay that way. I appreciate the perspective. No, I'm, go I'm sorry. <laughs> Hard part, but that is though, is like, man, like after you done got yourself established, it's easier for you to go and like do different things. But then it's like you gotta break that mind state that you created for yourself because you just got so used to 
doing things this way and you've gotten success doing things this way. So like, yeah, you got Mr. Fixer down the street who's licensed, bond, insured, white guy. He does a great job. You know how exactly how long it's going to take him to turn it around. And like your business has been set up on you being able to turn these things around, flip them or whatever you got going on or open a business. You don't got to take that long for renovations. You switch from Mr. Fixer that has that, um, that infrastructure once again to buddy on the corner that can do the renovations. But now as me and Kelly used to talk about before, he don't got the uh, capital to be able to get the equipment that he needs in order to be able to do that job. Mm. But remember what we said earlier though, exploitation. If, if instead of me looking at him as someone I'm gonna hire to do my job, if instead I'm looking at Mr. Fix It and going, how much business does he do and how can I take it from him? <laughs> so you're gonna hire you gonna hire my guy on the corner. No, I'm not gonna hire him. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm 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 hire his sister. Cause his sister got some brains and she got some kids and she need to put food on her table. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tell her sister, look, young lady, how about I put you in business for yourself? The choke how about we go about leverage? How, how about we go downtown? We're going to get you a business license. We're going to get you some insurance. We're going to now, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you who you're going to hire. You're going to hire your brother, right? <laughs> He's going to be your general manager, right? You're going to hire his high school friends. Okay. You're going to put this business together. No, don't tell nobody where you got it from, but we're going to do this together. Now that's your first contract right there. Mr. Fix it. Don't know it, wow. but his about his ass about to go out of business. Right. Right. No, I mean, right? That's a dope concept, man. I, oh. And so it's exploitation. I'm, we go in there and and how, why do you think Facebook does it? Oh man, that's so, that's, that's the same game he plays. That's the leverage. same game he plays. Mm, 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 mm. Man, Facebook got it so deep, man. Facebook got people designing the app to make it addictive, man. Like they, mm -hmm. they really like you talked about how like you don't you don't want to do certain things in order for like the exploitation of the community and how much money you can make. Man, that's all on the back burner, dog. Yeah, got, sometimes I wrestle with that thought because they, they got it. They got it for that long time. You want to get like thirty seconds? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So tonight, man, we touched on some serious topics, man, and really, really, really. Mm -hmm. What hit me from this conversation tonight, man, is what you said earlier, Sifu, and what you kind of just said just now, Trey, is that number one, we're trying to undo, you know, five generations worth of exploitation and five, six year in a lifetime. That's number one. We're not setting up to even play the long game. Um, number two, we didn't get into this mess overnight. We didn't just wake up and impoverish underclass people. You know, this is a system that is being utilized to keep us in this position. And last but not least, the way out of it is just actually doing something that can get you an opportunity to make more money. Um, the example with, you know, Zeus, you know, just taking a start, servicing it, moving forward, Example with Amazon, starting off, you know, being a home builder, not necessarily trying to be Mungo, you know, not necessarily trying to be the biggest home builder in the world, but just a really good home builder. Those things, I think, are very important concepts. I think also you have to look at um, where we are right now, and what's happening in our economy. We're moving to a digital based economy at a rapid rate, but transportation still has to be done by trucks. Um, houses still have to be built. Data centers that house all the storage for all these economic systems that are being online have to be built. So it's also being able to take a look at what's going on around you and what the future is holding for you and being able to position yourself so you're not obsolete in five years. So I think tonight, man, it's really been an interesting conversation with you brothers, man, around the missing links in our community and the parts in our community that we just need to say, you know what, let's pick this, look at it for what it is and press go on it. Let's just, you know, let's press go. 
Let's stop being afraid. Let's stop worrying about what we don't know. Go seek the information that we don't know so we're better educated and better prepare ourselves, but that still shouldn't stop us from moving forward. Right. Yeah, I think I think the difficult part on that too is the recognition of the mentality. Cause like like how you say, yo, you you like to start things like when they're all the way together. And that's because like you're looking at this and it's like, man, like I'm not just trying to take this first step out the box, man. I'm trying to jump the square 10, bro. Like I'm trying to be, I'm trying to make all the money out here. You know what I'm saying? And like, like how you just put it up, man. Like it's been five generations. And like a lot of us are looking like, man, like I'm trying to get where they at, man. Like I, like it's tangible for us. We see these people with these things, but that's skipping so many steps. Right. And that's so difficult for us to be able to rationalize in our own head because it's like, man, like, dog, like, I'm not okay with just, you know, being this much better, yo. Like, I want to be this much better. And I'm there, dog. It's like, man, like, I, like, it's not enough to just be a little bit better. And how how can we frame that mentality? Because that's, that's how we collectively, like, if collectively we get this much better, like, a small step for each of us becomes a huge step, a giant step for Black people. And a large step for any one of us three is this much of a movement for Black people. And, and you know, that's kind of funny that you say that, Trey, man. It's a very good point, man, because, you know, Kobe and Michael Jordan, the only difference really between them is one ring, you know. But that one ring is a monumental gap and a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of everything had to be put in place for that one extra ring, right? And for a lot of people, Jordan got six, Kobe got four, huh? I thought Kobe had five. I think Kobe got four. Pretty sure Kobe got five. Kobe got five rings. Kobe got five? Three with Shaq, two by itself. Yeah, Kobe got five. Kobe do got five. Yeah, so Are you know what I'm saying? Do not disrespect <laughs> the mom. Well, uh, no, but I mean, but the honest to God truth is, no, what you just said was actually very monumental just for me to actually reflect on. I am a guy who likes to go in, hit hard, get as much money as I can and disappear. But that also is something that comes from the mindset that you said. Like, I don't really like to start small and I don't really like to waste my time starting small. But sometimes that is the start. Sometimes that is where you need to be the most comfortable because it gives you the greatest chance of being, you know, not only having longevity, but it gives you a true appreciation for what you're doing. Man, you no, know, think about it. Even if you think about building something, even if you think about building something, if you want to build something tall real fast, you're not building no big old foundation, dog. You about to put a brick on top of another brick on top of another brick, and you're going to build it up real fast. You know what I'm saying? Now, if you're going to be like, all right, now I'm going to start slow. I'm going to take my time and I'm going to build this thing so that, you know what I'm saying, we all can get up here, then you're going to spread a wide foundation. And it's not going to be, you're not going to get as high as quickly. But way more people can come up that staircase with you. Interesting perspective. Hmm. Sifu, man, what are your closing thoughts, brother? Well, Trey I mean, just to, just, yeah, just to build on what Trey is saying, I think... Um, for some reason, my brain just don't work that way. I always come, and you know, I don't do this on purpose. I know it looked like I do this on purpose, but I really don't. Right. It's just that my brain just looks at it differently. Right. So, so the two examples you gave, um, no one can, no one can knock their accomplishments. Six rings, five rings, two rings, one. Who the heck cares? The impact is to the people that were that paid the money to go to those games. The impact that each of them had was their impact on the in industry that was multi-billion dollars worth of impact right. on on industries that span one end of the end of the market to the other. Who cares how many rings they had? They were both industries all in and of themselves. So a small step, one ring between them, two rings between them, small step for any one of them was huge to all of the industries that they touched. Yeah, but I'm talking about for black people, though. I'm talking about for black people. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about for black people. I mean, so, no, black people were not the names on the jerseys. Black people were not. I mean, just think of the person who sold the shoestrings that went in the shoes. Just the shoestrings alone. 
Right. That was not a that was not a black person. No, it wasn't. But how many white people do you know of that carry as much pride as a black person does in the name Michael Jordan? It's not not as many on, on surface, but they do. They do. They do. They, they do. do. And if and if you ask them about him, they're gonna cuss his name because oh man, he he invested in prisons. But they're gonna still wear his sneaker. I've never wore Jordans in my life. You know what I mean? I was I was in I was in the store just the other day and watched one kid after the other come in looking for a sneaker that had the emblem on it with him, you know, legs wide open, shoot hitting the dunk. So honest that's, to God, truth. That's right? the emblem that they wanted. I'm that's the, the emblem that they wanted. I'm probably the weirdest black person in the world, but I've never liked Michael Jordan shoes. Um, I tried them on one day. I was in middle school. They felt terrible on my feet. And I have never in my life purchased a pair of Jordans in my life. Never. My issue is idolatry. I looked at it as idolatry. I don't, I don't, I don't like you enough for me to want to wear your shoes. Yeah. I really don't. And mm-hmm. the fact that somebody else likes you that much is, is an affront to me. Oh no! I had the Charles Barkley's in the Grand Hills, though. I rock those. You know? I see. I see. I see buying Jordans the same way as I see going to school. It's for verification purposes. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you gotta, you gotta, you gotta cross, you gotta check a certain box, a couple boxes in order for you to get what you want. Mm-hmm. So you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Oh, man. But, but I think both of them too much money. <laughs> <laughs> But I think us doing this um, will not have an impact or the impact that we want just yet. I think the impact that we are looking for is one commiserate to the passion that we feel for what drives us. And there will always be a mismatch between those two things. Hmm. We will always be more passionate than the progress we're making because that's the thing that drives us. That's you know pain. what I mean? That's pain, exactly. That's pain, you're right. Mm. You're absolutely right about that. And More that pain, that pain uh-huh. runs generations. That pain runs generations and that pain goes forward generations because I can look at my children and be sad for the future that I know they're gonna have to fight just as as hopeful and prideful as I am in them, knowing the tools and the capabilities that they have, because I'm very proud of my children, but I'm still sad and I still am in pain for the fight I know they're gonna have to continue. So you're right, that pain goes in both directions. It goes way back generations and it goes forward generations. So we're not gonna have the impact that our passions deserve but we're gonna have one. But that's what I'm saying. I'm saying, how can we, how how do we tell people that and they're supposed to be okay with that? Like, dang, bro, like you gonna bust your behind, you gonna bust your ass, boy. And the impact that you gonna have not gonna be like, it's not gonna be proportional to the passion, to the pain that you feel in this moment. And you gotta be okay with that. Like how, how, we, how we break that news to somebody? Why would you? A, a general doesn't tell his soldiers I right, on the other side of that hill, that's your ass, you dead. They don't tell him that. <laughs> what they tell him is, we're going to get to the top of the hill. We're going to own this hill. This hill's going to have our flag on it. The enemy don't know what's about to hit him. He don't know what about to As a matter of fact, he can't even imagine the hell we're about to rain on him. Let's go. And everybody goes, yay. And then when he gets to the top of the hill, oop, he dead. <laughs> yo, <laughs> yo, that's a dope concept, yo, because I think as young people, um, me and Trey both suffer from the purest mentality, you know, it's like, yeah, it needs to be, it, yeah, it needs to be told in a way that is the truth and nothing but the truth. And when you look at the world that we live in, it's more so in the what's permitted mentality. Mm-hmm. I would, I would want somebody to tell me the truth, dog. That's what I'm saying. Like, and I guess that's not just it. Yo, that's just not how the world works. That's why me and you would be okay. both on the top of that hill dead, you know, because nobody <laughs> left out of the blanks of the truth. We like, yo, we like, yeah, we gonna kill them. Yeah, we about to get them hell. <laughs> and that wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, y'all give them hell. 
<laughs> oh man. Well, wow. Trey, I tell you what, I will always tell you the truth. I appreciate now, it. The Same problem here. with me always telling you the truth is now I got to deal with you looking at me cross eyed, going, Nah, man, I ain't doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might not always like the truth, huh? Yeah, you know I mean? <laughs> nah, man, you may not always like the truth, homie. Sometimes yeah. it's you know. It, but I'm it, I'm okay with that, man. I would rather I would rather that and know what the hell I'm getting into than to be saying, yeah, hell yeah, we about to give them hell. You're right. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a rare spirit that can actually sit down and digest nothing but truth every day, um, because that is um. That's very difficult because, you know, like Sifu said, people have projections, expectations, and images of you that go beyond who you even are. And a lot of times you know this and you will spend a lot of time trying to project that image yep. to make sure that you're meeting a completely unrealistic expectation in the first place. Man, but as a so, pragmatist and a strategist, though, you got to know. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, being truthful is, you know, shattering that very, you know, glow that somebody has when they look at you, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, I, you know, baby, I'm not that, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm, I'm who I am. <laughs> but see, but see that, that's a matter of commitment. You know what I mean? That's a matter of commitment. So I don't, I'm, I'm about to show how much a nerd I am. Um, the movie The Hobbit, right? You ever watch those? You watch all of those? All right. So the last one, um, the, the where they, they go and they kill the dragon, right? The last one. We'll turn okay. it to king. Right. Okay. So there's a song that they sing just before that last battle. And I I I, I recorded the song and I used to play it over and over and over and over and over again because there's there's a there's a deep meaning to that song and basically the lyrics I don't remember the lyrics exactly but it goes all right this is it guys we're all about to die we all know we're about to die so we're gonna drink this last cup to each other because in this cave is a dragon and his ass breathes fire. And that fire is hot enough to burn the very stone that we're standing on. But I know that I can give my life for you because I know you're about to give your life for me. And I thought about that. It wasn't a question of, I'm going to give my life because you might live. I'm going to give my life because I know you're about to give your life for me. And we're going to all drink this last drink together. That's commitment. Bill now, Baggins. I hear you. Boy. <laughs> I hear you, boy. You know, now if I'm standing next to you and I know you have that same commitment, and I know that the passion that courses through your veins is as hot as mine is, I can tell you the truth. In fact, I need to tell you the truth because it's the truth that's going to keep you burning hot enough to give your life for me because I'm about to give mine for you. Mm. If you step into something like that, you know, if you step into the, or if you step into an organization, an agreement, a desire, a goal, and that's the level of commitment you have, we will be as impactful as we want to be, even if all it is is for ourselves. And I honestly think at the heart of what ails us as the people, that's part of it. We don't have, we don't have that type of commitment. Mm. Some of us used to. Some of us used to. Like I'm, like I said, I'm still reading um, John Meacham's book. Um, His truth is marching on about John Lewis. He had it. He had that level of commitment. He had that level of commitment because he said he could see. He lived it. He felt the sticks. He felt the dogs. He felt the horses. He bore the scars. So he knew what the cost was. So for you to, to ask him, was it worth it? Hell yeah, it was worth it. You know, if, if I can come out my door and I can pick a newspaper up off the ground and I can see a white man walk by 
and I can look him dead in his eyes and say my name as loud as I want and not have to worry that a paddy wagon is going to come snatch me, string me up to a tree and burn my body. It was worth it. Hmm. It was worth yeah. it. On that same on that same vein though, the the when they, when they were going to fight and they were saying like, all right, man, like all of us not gonna make it. That's the reality of the situation. Some of y'all gonna get strung up. Some of y'all gonna get beat to death. The dogs gonna come and get you. The water hose is coming. Like the horses gonna do whatever. Like, is it is it is it that thought that like, all right, we gonna die today. But there's somebody else coming behind us that's gonna benefit from us that drives them, because I can because like listen to see a story about about Bilbo and them, like with the dragon, like yeah like okay like we all gonna die, but why dog? Like if ain't nobody else coming behind us to benefit from us going to fight in this dragon, like if the dragon just gonna be alive and and we know we about to die, why are we doing this? Because what was in it for them? What was in it for them was a home. What was in it for them was something to call their own. What was in it for them was for once to stand on their own ground and say, I am not black. I am American. Hmm. That's what was in it for them. You can't call me black. I'm not African. You took that away from me. You can't call me black. I'm not Haitian. You took that away from me. I'm not a Negro. I'm not a nigger. I'm not a slave. I'm not your help. I'm not leftover trash from your story of history. What I am, I'm American. Because America doesn't exist if I don't build it. And I'm dead, yep. And the man standing next to me is dead. But for right now, on this moment, I'm American. And you're gonna know that. And maybe somewhere down the road, somebody else will come along and have the courage to stand up to that dragon. Yo, maybe. End- hey, yo, Sifu, we gonna end there for the night. Oh man, I really appreciate that energy, yo. I really appreciate the spirit of this, man. This has been a great discussion, man. We're gonna pick up where we left off on that one for next week, man. Hold on real quick here. <laughs>